Well, everyone was forced to read Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet in high school, but I learned last week about an off-Broadway play called Romeo and Bernadette. The pandemic interrupted production twice, but the musical is now up and running in select theaters. In the script, Romeo gets transported from 16th century Verona to the 1960s, where he falls in love with Bernadette, who is the foul-mouthed daughter of a Brooklyn crime boss. And guess what? Romeo and Bernadette has a happy ending, which is strange because I thought the whole point was the sad ending of the original. And so if you want your Shakespeare without all the Shakespearean tragedy, then Romeo and Bernadette may be right for you. But for some people, Romeo and Juliet is cathartic. Isn't it strange how some people enjoy the feelings of sadness that get generated from hearing about other people's tragedies? A few months back, Stacy and I watched a movie called I Still Believe. It's based on the life of contemporary Christian singer-songwriter Jeremy Camp. And it's one of the saddest movies I've ever seen. It's a horse kick in the gut, really. And about halfway through, I asked myself, why am I watching this? <laughs> Generally, I try to avoid feelings of sadness in life. But if you enjoy the catharsis that comes from stories like these, then you're going to love this morning's opening illustration from history. Come back in time with me to 19th century Argentina. Like most South American countries of the time, Argentina was run by a brutal dictator. His name was General Juan Manuel de Rosas. And with the help of his goons, General Rosas kept a tight rein on every aspect of Argentinian life through state-sponsored terrorism. But General Rosas was considered, uh, he liked to consider himself a family man, and he had a lovely daughter named Manuela. And Manuela's best friend was a wealthy young socialite named Camilla O'Gorman. As her name suggests, Camilla was the daughter of a displaced Irishman. So his best friends Camilla and Manuela spent a lot of time together in the governor's uh, residence. As such, Camilla was carefully watched. She lived a sheltered life. She was chaperoned everywhere she went. Only the most trusted friends and family could get close to Camilla. And that's where Father Ladislo Gutierrez comes in. Father Gutierrez was an old seminary brother, a buddy of Camilla's brother. And as a Jesuit priest, he was assigned to the O'Gorman family's parish. The Jesuits were one of the few organizations who had been brave enough to stand up to the Rosas regime. They publicly denounced his brutality. In fact, General Rosas would later ban the Jesuit society from Argentina. But if you couldn't trust a priest, then who could you trust? So Father Gutierrez was welcomed into the O'Gorman family. But then something unexpected happened. The beautiful Camilla started developing feelings for the handsome young priest, and he started falling for her. But what could they do? He was a priest. What about his vows of celibacy? And she was from a wealthy, influential family. How could the O'Gorman clan ever recover from such a scandal? So the two young lovers pined for one another. The one thing that they wanted most in life was just out of reach. Eventually, however, their passions got the best of them. On December 12, 1847, Father Gutierrez and Camilla eloped under the cover of darkness. They fled Buenos Aires and resettled in the small town of Goya, posing as school teachers. They even established the town's first school. They were doing good work, but back home, Bad things were happening. To save face, Camilla's father claimed that Father Gutierrez had kidnapped his daughter. And the Catholic Church was beside itself. Church officials were deeply humiliated that one of their own would run off with someone from such a high-profile family. And General Rosas' opponents took the opportunity to rail against the moral degradation of the, of the nation under his regime. Every major political and religious institution in the country was scandalized by the actions of these two lovers. But for Camilla and Father Gutierrez, it was the happiest time of their lives. They were finally living an anonymous life together. But we know how this is bound to end. This is a Shakespearean tragedy, remember? After just six precious months, the traveling priest recognized Gutierrez and reported him to the authorities. Both he and Camilla were arrested and brought back to Buenos Aires to face justice. I'm not sure what crime they had committed, but something had to be done. And it didn't help that Father Gutierrez had been critical of the regime. So General Rosas was ready to make an example out of them. Now, Camilla could have saved her own skin by putting all the blame on Gutierrez. She could have claimed that 
he, he had indeed kidnapped her, or maybe she was just blinded by his charm. But Camilla would have none of that. She insisted that she had instigated the relationship with the priest, and she was cons a consenting participant in their romance. But not all, not all hope was lost. Camilla still had an ace up her sleeve. She asked her old friend Manuela to plead with her father for leniency. But General Rosas had made up his mind. Leniency equaled weakness at a time he couldn't afford to be seen as weak. And to keep his fragile regime in power, Rosas couldn't afford that. So he threatened to execute both Camilla and Father Gutierrez. It was an outrageous sentence, especially considered that by this time Camilla was pregnant. Not to mention that Rosas himself wasn't exactly the standard bearer of morality. He had fathered five children outside of his own marriage. But General Rosas had no time for such qualms. And on August 18, 1848, after allowing Camilla's unborn baby to be blessed by a priest, both she and Father Gutierrez were gunned down by a firing squad. He was 24 years old. She was just 23. General Rosas' own secretary, an old, an old soldier named Antonino Reyes, had been tasked with overseeing the double execution, but he just couldn't bring himself to watch it. And out of compassion, he had Camilla and Father Gutierrez buried in the same coffin. If they couldn't be together in this life, at least they could be together at the resurrection, he thought. Meanwhile, the nation was rightfully appalled. It was the first time a woman had been executed in Argentina, a pregnant woman at that. So public sentiment turned against the general, and after a string of political defeats, Rosas fled to England where he lived out the rest of his days in exile. The forbidden relationship of Camilla O'Gorman and Father Gutierrez <clears throat> has been romanticized in Argentinian culture. Their love for one another has been the subject of countless films and plays, and each script explores this one burning question. Was it worth it? Is it worth it to get that thing you've always wanted, only to lose it a few months later? later. At the death of his best friend, British poet Lord Tennyson wrote the following tribute. I hold it true, where befall, I feel it when I sorrow most. It is better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. But is this really true? Was it true for Camilla O'Gorman and Father Gutierrez? Because I'm not sure the woman in today's scripture passage would agree. Folks, this one's going to hurt a little bit today because it's a tough story. I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings 4, 8 through 37. Now that we've all been uplifted by that story, there is hope. If you don't have a Bible, you're welcome to take out one of ours from the shelf uh, underneath the pew in front of you and turn to page 309 in that Bible. Page 309, you'll find 2 Kings 4, 8 through 37. Or just scan the QR code on the worksheet in your bulletin with your smartphone. Welcome to our spring series of messages entitled, The Quickening. If you're new with us, we've been going through these different stories that talk about resurrections in the Bible. The term quickening refers to the first movements of a baby that a pregnant woman can feel in her womb. Before modern technology, the quickening was considered the first sign of real life. There was a living being in there. But in scripture, we find another type of quickening. It was the quickening of dead men, men who had once lied dead were made alive again by the power of God. People who were lifeless showed signs of life. And this is what we desperately need today by the power of Jesus. Our hearts need to be resurrected. Our spirits need to be quickened. Churches need revival. This is the quickening. And these, as we've been looking at, are all the different resurrections in the Bible. And as we learned last week, uh, there is no resurrection possible without the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of the Son of God proved that there is eternal life after death. We talked about that last week on Resurrection Sunday. And Jesus promised that through faith in him, we too will be resurrected to eternal life just as he was. But as we've been seeing through this entire series, before a resurrection can happen, of course, there must be a death. And as we'll see today, sometimes that death is excruciating. Sometimes the loss is more than we can bear. And we wonder if love is really worth the loss. Just ask the woman from our passage today. 2 Kings chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 8. Here's the story from the Old Testament. One day, Elisha 
went on to Shunem, where a wealthy woman lived, who urged him to eat some food. So whenever he passed that way, he would turn in there to eat food. And she said to her husband, Behold now, I know that this is a holy man of God who is continually passing our way. Let us make a small room on the roof with the walls and put him there, a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. So whenever he comes to us, he can go in there. So if you remember, a couple weeks ago, we looked at the prophet Elijah. Elijah was the greatest prophet of the Old Testament, and God used him to resurrect the son of the widow of Zarephath. Well, eventually, Elijah's career would come to an end, and he would need a successor. And his successor was Elisha. In some ways, Elisha was greater than even Elijah, as was recorded a couple chapters back. I want to look at this, 2 Kings 2.9. It says, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken away from you. And Elisha said, please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And indeed, Elisha would go on to do even more amazing things than his mentor, even after his own death. One time, a man who had been tossed into Elisha's tomb walked out alive. But during his life, Elisha often traveled from his home at Mount Carmel through the nearby town of Shunem. And a wealthy woman there recognized the greatness of God that rested upon Elisha. So she convinced her husband to add on a room to their home that the prophet could use whenever he was passing through. And Elisha appreciated this selfless act of generosity, so he decided to bless the Shunammite woman in the same way Elijah had blessed him. In essence, he wrote her a blank check for whatever she wanted. Let's look at it, picking up the story in verse 11. One day he came there, and he, told, he turned into the chamber and rested there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, Call this Shunammite. When he had called her, she stood before him. And he said to him, Say now to her, See, you have taken all this trouble for us. What is there to be done for you? Would you have a word spoken on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? She answered, I dwell among my own people. And he said, What then is to be done for her? Gehazi answered, Well, she has no son and her husband is old. He said, Call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the doorway and he said, at this season, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, no, my Lord, O man of God, do not lie to your servant. But the woman conceived, and she bore a son about that time the following spring, as Elisha had said to her. Now, I know we have a lot of wrestling fans here this morning. And I'm not talking about the Iowa Hawkeyes wrestling team. I'm talking about wrestling. <laughs> I'm talking about people getting all greased up and fighting each other on TV. But some of you won't admit that you like professional wrestling. In polite company, you'll talk about how silly it would be for anyone to watch stage fights on television. But I know how you are. I know how excited you get for WrestleMania, brother. You can't fool me. And there's good reason to like wrestling. Those guys do a lot of charity work. I'm sure you've all heard of the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Make-A-Wish grants wishes to terminally ill children. And oftentimes their wish is to meet their favorite celebrity. Well, guess who has granted more wishes than any other celebrity in the world? Despite being one of the busiest people in show business, wrestler and actor John Cena has granted over 650 wishes to terminally ill kids who wanted to meet him. And you don't have to like professional wrestling to think that's pretty awesome, right? And that's pretty much what Elisha offered the Shunammite woman. He offered to introduce her to some very powerful and influential people. She could have asked for protection. She could have asked for security. She could have even asked for money. But the Shunammite woman didn't need any of that. She dwelled among her own people. She had no enemies. And she had plenty of money. So rather than asking for more than what she really needed, she demurred. She was humble and she was content. She didn't want anything. But Elisha wouldn't take no for an answer. He was determined to bless her, so he called in his secretary, Gehazi, and asked him what he thought she would want. And Gehazi mentioned that the woman and her husband had not been blessed with children. So Elisha announced to her that God would give them a son. But isn't the woman's response interesting? Even the suggestion of having a son scared her. She wouldn't allow herself to entertain the hope and she wouldn't let anyone mess with her about it. She told the prophet that he'd better not say that unless 
He meant it. But sure enough, a year later, she gave birth to a son. What a blessing that would have been. It was the best gift that money couldn't buy. It was the only thing she'd ever wanted but dared not ask for. And now it was a reality. So she must have loved that son, of course. But much like the love of Camilla O'Gorman and Father Gutierrez, it would be short-lived. This relationship seemed doomed from the beginning. Picking up the story in verse 18. 2 Kings 4.18, when the child had grown, he went one day to his father among the reapers. And he said to his father, oh, my head, my head. The father said to his servant, carry him to his mother. And when he had lifted him and brought him to his mother, the child sat on her lap till noon, and then he died. And we don't know how many years later this incident happened, but it couldn't have been long. The boy was old enough to walk and talk, but he was still young enough to be easily carried And it seems that the boy had suffered from heat stroke while he was out in the field with his dad. The throbbing headache was the telltale sign. And if not properly treated, a heat stroke can be fatal. Well, the father evidently didn't think much of it. He had a servant simply carry the boy home. But a few hours later, he was dead in his mother's lap. She loved this boy more than anything. But now he's lost. Her very heart had been snatched from her. And as we'll see in a moment... I'm not sure that this love for her was worth the loss. How could God have been so cruel? She'd never asked for any of this, but it happened. And from this story, we learn a sweeping principle about life. We don't get to choose the crosses we bear, nor do we get to choose what blessings we receive. These things just happen. Now, certainly, if we are wise and make good choices, then naturally there's a better chance of good things happening to us. And if we make reckless and foolish choices, then naturally there's a better chance of bad things happening to us. But that's not what we're talking about here. We are talking about those good or bad things in life that just happen. And they're completely out of our control. Sometimes in life we get the love, and sometimes we get the loss. And that's our main point from today's passage. If you'd like to write it down, it's in your bulletin. The main point is no life is entitled to all gain, and no life is deserving of all pain. I'm not being theological here. I know that we deserve, you know, we're sinners and things like that. So, but just a general principle of life here without getting real theological. No life is entitled to all gain, and no life is deserving of all pain. This principle is played out in the Old Testament story of the prophet Job. Job was a good man. He worked hard. He lived his life wisely. And as a result, naturally, good things started happening to him. Job was wealthy and healthy. But then out of nowhere, all those things were taken from him. He lost it all. And in his pain, Job recognized this principle in life. He said, so Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. And he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God, and shall we not receive evil? And in all this, God did not sin with his lips. And Jesus, of course, he observed this same principle in life we're talking about. In Matthew 5, 45, he reiterated this. He says, For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So no one's life is all love and gain. We are not entitled to that. We don't deserve that. We know that. Because we all do some pretty messed up things sometimes in life. And neither is anyone's life all loss and pain. Even awful people have good things happen to them sometimes. Even the most difficult lives sometimes have good times. And I know that this principle drives us crazy Our sense of justice demands that people receive immediate karma. We want to see good deeds rewarded and bad deeds punished. But part of being a mature person is moving past this unrealistic demand for fairness. God will level the playing field in the very end. He will eventually right every wrong. But in the meantime, it won't do us any good to refuse to accept what we plainly see with our own two eyes in this life. Sometimes good things happen. Sometimes bad things happen, and there's absolutely nothing we can do about it. Camillo Gorman and Father Gutierrez, they didn't deserve to die, but they did. And this Shunammite woman, 
didn't deserve to lose her son. She didn't even ask for a son. All she wanted to do was help Elisha. Here we are in the passage. And she's not shy about letting Elisha know exactly what she thinks of all this. She may have been devastated and heartbroken and desperate, but she's also really ticked off. Let's pick up the story in verse 21. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door behind him and went out. Then she called to her husband and said, Send me one of the servants and one of the donkeys that I may quickly go to the man of God and come back again. And he said, Why will you go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, All is well. Then she saddled the donkey and she said to her servant, Urge the animal on. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When the man of God saw her coming, he said to Gehazi, her servant, Look, there's a Shunammite. Run at once to meet her and say to her, Is all well with you? Is all well with your husband? Is all well with the child? And she answered, All is well. And when she came to the mountain to the man of God, she caught hold of his feet. And Gehazi came to push her away. But the man of God said, Leave her alone, for she is in bitter distress. And the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. Then she said, Did I ask my Lord for a son? Did I not say, do not deceive me? He said to Gehazi, tie up your garment and take my staff in your hand and go. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do not reply and lay my staff on the face of the child. Then the mother of the child said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. So she didn't tell her husband what had happened. She didn't have time. She didn't tell Gehazi. She just pushed past him. Indeed, she clung to Elisha and gave him an earful. And notice that in this section, Elisha is only referred to as the man of God. Elisha represents God here. And the woman is not letting Elisha, uh, not just letting Elisha have it. I mean, she's pouring out her complaint to God. But you just can't say whatever you want to God. So Gehazi moved in to push her away and rebuke her for her lack of decorum. But Elisha wasn't angry. He saw that she is hurting, and, but he didn't yet understand why. And we don't understand why these things happen to us. God didn't tell Elisha, just as God doesn't tell us. But the Shunammite woman poured out her heart to him. She questioned him. She balked at even having the child in the first place. And notice, she never asked for anything, not even now. She didn't ask Elijah to somehow heal her son. She didn't believe that God could give her a son in the first place, so I'm sure she didn't believe that he could resurrect him. So she was just there clinging to the man of God, yelling at him. She would not turn God loose. And you know what? That was exactly the response God was okay with. God had given her love, and God had caused her loss. God had done it. So we had no problem with her reaction in this passage. She could holler and scream and cry just as long as she didn't walk away. And that's her application from today's passage in your bulletin. The application is this. You can talk, you can balk, and you can sulk. Just don't walk. You talk to God, you can balk, you can sulk around. Just don't walk away from him. I don't drop the curtain real often. I like to tell you stories about other people's lives rather than my own because it's not about me and you don't come here to listen to me talk about myself. But sometimes the shoe fits. Uh, We have been blessed with six uh, healthy pregnancies, but we haven't batted a 1,000. Between our fifth and sixth uh, children, there was a miscarriage, and many of you know what that feels like. It's horrible. Uh, It may not be as bad as what the Shunammite woman experienced here, but it's bad enough, and we don't need to compare sorrows. But here's what was especially galling for me about our miscarriage. We weren't trying for a sixth child. We didn't ask for that pregnancy. We were perfectly content with the children we had. The pregnancy was just kind of a fluke that happens sometimes. But we don't get to choose the blessings we get sometimes, right? And it was a blessing. Well, right after we told everyone including our children, uh, the miscarriage happened. And listen, I can take the pain. You know, if, it were, if we were the only ones to know about it, I would have been okay with that. But when you have to go to your children and tell them that the little one that they were 
so excited to receive, receive into the family wasn't coming anymore. Well, let's just say that that wasn't much fun. The kids were devastated. Our home was a mess. But I remember lying in bed and telling God that we had never asked for any of this. We weren't trying to have another baby. He was the one who had allowed this to happen, and he'd need to be the one to clean up his mess. And if I ever publicly prayed the prayer I said that night, I might get fired because I was angry. I believe that my self-righteousness was justified. I felt sorry for myself. And I told God exactly what I thought about it, questioned him. But never, ever did I consider walking away from him. I wasn't going to let him off the hook that easily. Listen, there's no answer that anyone could have given me that night that would have satisfied. When something like that happens, there's no gain. There's only pain. Oh, sure, we can tell ourselves that what doesn't kill us make us stronger. And yes, these things allow us to empathize with others better. But come on, I mean, there was no bright side. It was all loss. And that's the sense we get from the Shunammite woman. It would have taken her several hours to travel to Elisha. It would have taken several hours to travel back. So her son would have been dead for the better part of a day. There's no hope. She didn't even ask for a resurrection. But she made Elisha come with her and look at her son's dead body laying on his bed. He at least owed her that. And if Elisha couldn't do anything about it, then at least he could come into her misery with her. But listen, God doesn't owe anyone a perfect life. Jesus' life sure wasn't perfect. And neither is God's when you think about it. He allows himself to be hurt over and over again by humanity. Uh, he gets it. He's okay with us clinging to his feet, and he's okay with being questioned. I think he can handle getting yelled at. The psalmist sure didn't hold back. You look at Psalm 13, he says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? And we think about it, not even Jesus held back. From the cross, it says, Mark 15, and at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, Lima Shabbatna, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And they shouted, they wrestled, they asked questions, but they never walked away. We simply don't have the right to opt out of humanity. We need to experience it, all of it, the pain and the gain. And no matter how much you talk, balk, or sulk, God won't walk away from you. So you can't walk away from him either. Just imagine if the Shunammite woman had walked away. Just imagine if she had decided that she was finished with God and his prophet. She would have missed all this. Look at verse 31. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff of the face on the child, but there was no sound or sign of life. Therefore, he returned to meet him and told him, The child is not awakened. When Elisha came into the house, he saw the child lying dead on his bed. So he went in and shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Then he went up and lay on the child, putting his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, and his hands on his hands. And as he stretched himself upon him, the flesh of the child became warm. Then he got up again and walked once back and forth in the house and went up and stretched himself upon him and the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. Then he summoned Gehazi and said, call this Shunammite. So he called her and when she came to him, he said, pick up your son. And she came and fell at his feet, bowing to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. I suppose these resurrections should be commonplace to us now as we've been studying them, but this is still extraordinary. Over the course of many fervent prayers, the boy's heart was quickened and he was returned to the arms of his mother, alive and well. Once again, God had done the impossible. He who was dead before his time was made alive again. He who was loved and lost was loved yet again. Behold the power of God. Folks, I can't promise you a miracle. Sometimes the resurrection just doesn't happen in this life. But I can promise you that your God will never walk away from you no matter what. And so don't walk away from him. I don't care if you kick and scream. I don't care if you punch and yell. I don't care if you sulk and question. You can feel self-righteous. You can feel right, righteously justified in your anger. You can feel sorry for yourself. 
just don't walk away. You may think that walking away will hurt God the most, but it will only destroy you. Because healing isn't found out there somewhere away from God. The quickening will never happen out there. It's hopeless out there. It will never get better out there. Here is where the hope is, with Jesus. The battle happens here, and so does the victory. In fact, I'd prefer to see a person kick and scream rather than pretending everything is okay. Pretending that everything is okay is just the passive-aggressive form of walking away. So maybe it's time to have that fight. I mean, really, do we think God is stupid? Do we think he's, that we're so good at hiding that you know, he can't find us? Do we think that we're so good at acting that he doesn't know how we feel? Maybe it's time to push your way past the niceties, push your way past Gehazi and bring it all to God. Maybe it's time to dig your claws into him and not let go. Maybe it's time to go 12 rounds. I mean, really, what's the alternative? You have nothing to lose by staying in the fight, but you might lose everything by walking away from it. The Shunammite woman loved, lost, and loved again. She experienced pain, gain, pain, and then gain again. Well, before she wouldn't even walk into Elisha's presence without being summonsed. In her pain, she pushed right in and told him exactly what was on her mind. She talked, she balked, she sulked, but she never walked away from the fight. And God never walked away from her. But next week we move back into the New Testament, and it should come as no surprise that Jesus was the catalyst for several of Scripture's resurrections. In fact, according to Jesus, life didn't make any sense without the truth of the resurrection. So read Luke 11 or Luke 7, 11 through 17 and 20, 27 through 40 this week, and you bring a friend next Sunday as we'll watch Jesus completely ruin a funeral. Let's pray. God, thank you for these people who've come, and and just, God, I just pray you would bless them for their faithfulness, for their attendance, for their work here, for their support of this work happening here. I pray the very, very best for them. Lord, there's people in this church who have experienced uh, more pain and loss than I can ever imagine. And Lord, I know the temptation is to run, to walk away. And God, I pray that each one of us, whether our pain has been great or small, that we would maybe kick and scream and yell, but Lord, we would never walk away. There's no healing out there. There's no hope out there. The fight happens in your presence, and so does the victory. So, Lord, if we do nothing else in our pain, I pray we would be honest with you and we would just stay right here in your presence. Thank you, Jesus. There's always hope whether we experience a resurrection in this life or the next. There's always hope. And we rejoice in that. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.